All right, let's get the obvious out of the way. The first rule of Fight Club is... You do not talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club is... You do not talk about Fight Club. Okay, okay. We're going to talk about Fight Club. Released in 1999, directed by David Fincher and adapted from the novel by Chuck Palahniuk, Fight Club is an ultra-violent reflection on masculinity, media, corporate culture, gender relationships, self-identity, fatherhood, and the conflict between individualism and collectivism. Fight Club, intentionally or not, exposes the crisis of masculine identity as the hetero white male is displaced as a societal default and the ugly hazardous reactions to that loss of unquestioned power. As we go through Fight Club, I want to hone the focus to how men interact with each other and with the concept of what it means to be a man, the societal construct, the collective idea that pops into everyone's head when we think of a real man. Also, from here on out, when I refer to Fight Club, I am more often than not referring to the organization within the movie and not the movie itself. The first thing that we need to get on the table is the notion of toxic masculinity. The common misinterpretation of this phrase is that it's being used to condemn all masculinity as though manhood itself is something inherently bad. Well, this is not true. Toxic masculinity refers to things that are typically encoded as positive or natural masculine traits that are, under a more critical look, actually damaging to self and surrounding. For example... Why? why? I don't know why. I don't know. Never been in a fight. You? No, but th that's a good thing. No, it is not. How much can you know about yourself if you've never been in a fight? Toxic masculinity is a social script that tells men and boys that the right way to be a man is to be violent, emotionally unavailable, sexually aggressive, and so forth. It's a narrow, confining definition of a man that shuts off a vast range of human experiences and marginalizes the men who fail to conform to that societal standard. It tells them what pursuits are worthy, what styles are acceptable, how a man walks, talks, and looks. Society is structured to reward men who follow the script and marginalizes those who don't. For example, aggression and hostility are held up as macho standards, natural, if not desirable, traits for men to have, despite their overwhelmingly negative impact on people, groups, and society. This has two operative effects. First, in lionizing and rewarding aggression, and second, in diminishing passivity. For an incredibly real example of the damage that lionizing aggression can cause, look no further than investment banking, an industry that attracts and rewards aggression like no other. Passive men are depicted as lesser, as weaker, as compromised, fake men, victimized by society, and the path to self-acceptance is in the primal embrace of violence. Take, for example, the priest who is recruited into Fight Club. Yeah! Yeah! Or, in my own life, when discussing this episode's writing on Twitter, Adam Baldwin sent me this image of Macho Putin punching jet fighters out of the air, contrasted against what I can only assume is meant to be seen as a weak, huggy-feely Obama. Attached was the message, toxic masculinity greater than hashtag new castrati. So this is kind of why this has proven to be such a deep-seated and difficult to address issue in society. The people most invested in the macho identity are actively, knowingly promoting it and defending it from change or criticism. This narrow masculine script is often presented as naturalistic or a bio-truth, something that's an emergent property of biology and thus immune to criticism. The examples of this are long and many. Boys will be boys, men think about sex every seven seconds, men can't be friends with women because every man wants to have sex with every woman, the idea that a real man is prepared and willing to get violent at a moment's notice, and so on and so on and so on. Now, to be clear here, the problem is not in being sexual or being sexually forward. No one is saying men should all become celibate monks, only donating sperm as needed to perpetuate the species. The problem is believing that male sexuality is inherently forward and that men are, by nature, unstoppable sex fiends. Not only is this limiting of men who, say, aren't all that interested in sex or who prefer to take a more passive role in their sexual encounters, it also creates an environment of entitlement by imbuing sexual aggression with a sense of inevitability. Ideas like men can't be friends with women because he will inevitably try to have sex with her, or far worse, ideas that trot dubiously along the boundaries of consent. This then cuts both ways, demonizing men as rapists in training, such as we saw in She's Out of Control. Okay, I get it. You want it to be my fault. I'll do a little grabbing, you'll do a little protesting. Okay, 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 I got it. All right. Timothy, stop it. 
It's my first time. I like to be special. Now take me home. <laughs> you teasing little bitch. And dismissing the role and agency of men who commit sexual violence, encapsulated in the all too typical post rape response, what did you think would happen? As though being raped is an inescapable natural consequence of being off guard around men. So yes, the issue of toxic masculinity isn't merely one of pop culture interest. It's a very real subject with tangible society-altering implications. Fight Club, the film, is a confused, messy celebration and self-condemnation of the worst of what masculinity has to offer. It revels in the violence that rips itself apart. It is in many ways constrained by the macho ideals that it criticizes, drunk on the power trip of violence and hedonism, all the while unable to escape the damage being done. The narrator, who we'll refer to as Jack, is our modern put upon every man. He has followed the societal script, grown up, gone to college, got a degree, got a job, has an apartment filled with furniture, and now what? I mean, you can't get married. I'm a 30 year old boy. Consumerism and being a corporate drone have failed to fill the void of community. At first, he fills this with support groups, posing as someone with, quote, real problems in order to find human connections through shared suffering. Something worth noting here is the downplay of the ennui that Jack is facing, his problems, his uncertainty, his identity crisis, though clearly damaging, isolating, and toxic, aren't seen as valid. Here is, in a sense, our carryover theme from the last episode. Jack recognizes that he is privileged, that the world revolves around him as a demographic, and yet he's still unhappy. I wasn't host to cancer or parasites. I was the warm little center that the life of this world crowded around. And yeah, he kind of blames women. We're a generation of men raised by women. I'm wondering if another woman is really the answer we need. The enemy in the end is his own macho expectations for himself and the world. It's telling and intentional that the first place Jack visits as a misery tourist and where he almost learns how to let go is in a support group for men with testicular cancer. These are, many of them, literally castrati. Societally, they are lesser men, and that pain runs through their dialogue, most notably the man speaking about his lost dreams of a family. With, with, her, uh, with her new husband. And, and thank God, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad for her. <laughs> she just... <destroyed. laughs> And within that, within the fake identity as a person with incurable disease, Jack is able to find a measure of fulfillment, a connection with other people, however facile it may be. Over the course of the first act, these two themes, the dehumanizing corporate consumer lifestyle and the sense of emasculation are then entwined. Passive-aggressive corporate culture is equated with a perceived feminization of society. We're a generation of men raised by women. I'm wondering if another woman is really the answer we need. The antidote, Tyler proposes, is to reclaim some notion of true primal manhood through blood and sweat, and Fight Club is born, a refuge for seemingly marginalized men looking to reclaim their manhood. The irony is, of course, that all of these men were already macho. They're already resentful and angry and ready to do violence. They're merely looking for permission. After all, who else would Fight Club appeal to? Can I be next? Despite the proposed desire to reclaim some lost manhood, Tyler Durden is already the idealized macho man. Is that what a man looks like? <laughs> well, I don't know. You tell me, considering Tyler Durden looks like this. I mean, this is explicit text. I look like you want to look, I fuck like you want to fuck, I am smart, capable, and most importantly, I'm free in all the ways that you are not. See, there's this language there. Is that what a man looks like? <laughs> Case in point. Bob never really belongs in Fight Club. He doesn't see his emasculation as a spiritual one, or even one that really makes him less of a man. Explained in their first meeting, Bob knows full well that his testicular cancer was the byproduct of the steroids he was using. He pursued the hypermasculine ideal, and it literally destroyed his manhood. But he is, to a point, at peace with that. His life goes on, a little dumb, a little gullible. He joins Fight Club seemingly as a game, titillated by the secret club aspect. I'm not supposed to talk about it. 
And the second rule is... When he first applies to Project Mayhem, he's rejected, as all candidates are, and simply accepts this, picks up his things and heads home, until conjoled into staying by Jack. Bob is, within this limited scope, our enlightened man. The one who is more or less okay with himself, and isn't troubled that he doesn't conform with the ideal. He's a little lonely and a little dumb, but that's about it. In Grand Tragedy, he is persuaded into going along with Project Mayhem, and pays for it with his life. The paradox that the film presents is that, in attempting to break away from the society that has exploited, dehumanized, and marginalized them, in attempting to reclaim individuality and identity, they replicate the very same exploitative and dehumanizing systems in their own microcosm, to the point of creating a system that literally strips them of individuality and identity. You are the same decaying organic matter as everything else. In Project Mayhem, we have no names. The foil is that the macho ideal of Fight Club isn't actually a break from the society that constrains them. It's the ideal that society fed them, but failed to deliver. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. In the beginning of the film, it's commercialism. Buy this furniture and you'll belong. Buy this coffee and you'll belong. Buy this condo and you'll belong. Get a good job and you'll belong. Work long hours and you'll belong. Just put in the time, pay your dues, and you'll belong. Within Fight Club and later Project Mayhem, it's violence. Vandalize this building and you'll belong. Start a new Fight Club and you'll belong. Adhere to the rules and you'll belong. And if you're not sure if you belong, well, if it's your first night at Fight Club, you have to fight. Commercialism and violence are both presented as the appropriately masculine identity markers, the uniform that all members must adopt to show their allegiance to the group. At work you wear a suit and tie. At Fight Club... Yeah. Alright man, lose the tie. No shirts, no shoes! In attempting to escape what is presented as an emasculating corporate system, Project Mayhem simply recreates it in miniature. Members of Project Mayhem are literally stripped of their names until they can be mythologized as martyrs. Project Mayhem is franchised, an international corporation led autocratically by the mythological Tyler Durden. This is a running theme of the film, where Jack consistently latches onto the outer trappings of systems and structures and imbues them with spiritual power, remaining uncritical of the underlying systems. When he, through Tyler Durden, invents Fight Club and Project Mayhem, the problem, from his point of view, isn't that the macho ideals were always unattainable garbage, a product-based identity that they were sold just the same as the coffee table shaped like a yin-yang, the problem is that it wasn't delivered in the form they wanted. That life, being rock gods and movie stars, was entitled to them. We're slowly learning that fact. We're very, very pissed off. Fight Club is, in essence, not a rejection of the status quo, but a distillation of it. The flaws are not in the power structures and exploitation, not in the telling of the myth, but in who was chosen to sit on the throne. While Tyler rejects the trappings, and now you're fucking khakis, he still embraces the myth itself. You were the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. This is a cargo cult mentality. This is where I want to call attention back to that first night with Bob at the testicular cancer support group. Surrounded by other men who did not fit the script society had written for them, Jack was able to let go, if only for a moment. But in that, Jack sees only the trappings of the support groups, the ritual of gathering and sharing weakness, and imbues that surface-level interaction with power, and begins to attend support groups every evening of the week. Fight Club sees only the ritual of gathering and sharing violence, and imbues that interaction with power. There's a very real replication of this that we see in day-to-day -day life, where underlying systems are copied with only a change of paint, members assuming that the paint job was the problem. Geek culture has a problematic relationship with women. Look at issues such as the conflict over booth babes, the very real need for initiatives like cosplay is not consent, and the content documented by the editors at Fat, Ugly, or Slutty. And yet there's still a folk belief that geek culture doesn't have a misogyny problem. Why? Well, because of a definition problem. In their minds, these well-meaning people have equated sexism with the heavy-handed objectification they believe embodies sports, hip-hop, and other mainstream pop culture, basically jock culture. It's a mistaken belief that those problems, the use and abuse of women, the sexism, the intolerance, are tied to the trappings of the culture, sport ball, cheap beer, and fast cars. The logic follows, if I reject sport ball and cars, if I reject jock culture, then I have, by nature, rejected misogyny and toxic masculinity. 
that's not true. Sports and cars and letterman jackets and binge drinking in Cancun are just the trappings, the outer forms, the window dressing. The actual problem is in the core, the narrow definitions of acceptable masculinity, the aggressive policing of male identity, the use of misogynist and homophobic language to disempower non-conforming men, the sense of natural entitlement to female attention, and a resentment of women who break from the script. It doesn't matter if you've replaced sports cars with League of Legends and Maxim with Cutie Honey, the power is not in the objects, the power is in the mentality. Online spaces still aggressively police masculine identity and sexuality, much like the members of Fight Club chasing the norms of a society that they claim to reject. Oh, and this sense of norms, of shared values, it's driven home in the bathroom scene where Project Mayhem assaults the commissioner and threatens to castrate him if he doesn't comply. Why use that threat? Because it means just as much to the mainstream as it means to Project Mayhem. And now I think we need to talk about Marla. Marla is the film's stand-in for women as a whole, and is the only woman with a speaking role past the first act. I mean, that's kind of its own can of worms, but we're not going to go there just because we don't have time. Like, really, we just, we don't have time. Okay, so Marla is the disrupting element. Her mere presence at the support groups calls attention to the myth and violates the power of the illusion, because Jack's investment is only surface deep. He is incapable of connecting as long as she's around because his ideal self is still Tyler Durden, that unconstrained, violent, sex-crazed sociopath who is simultaneously a rebel against the system and the embodiment of every value the system holds dear. Ultimately, Marla is the expression of Jack's inability to relate to women outside the societal constructs, both his internalized concept of women as well as his concepts of men. The only women who he can connect with, albeit in a very superficial way, are nurturers, motherly figures. With Marla, who is practically the antithesis of a nurturer, he can only interact with her in the context of aggression or sex, the only roles that his internal macho ideal is capable of. Marla intruding into the testicular cancer support group is this giant symbol of women, air quote, invading male spaces, and that disruption, that ability to go outside the feminine roles that Jack feels she ought to be constrained to, makes him jealous, envious, and angry because he feels constrained to his spaces. It exposes his own sense of otherness, his own position as someone out of place in the circle of castrated men. And castration, as we've mentioned before, is a critical theme of the film. It's a symbol of male potency, but a symbol that only holds power if and when potency is a desired value. It's a social construct through and through. The support group demonstrates this. Damage of losing your testicles is primarily a psychological one. Before we learn about Bob's health condition, once again damage caused by steroid abuse in the pursuit of a hypermasculine ideal, we're shown the societal impact, the man who feels he's lost his place in the world because he can't fulfill the narrative of a white picket fence, two boys and a girl. Tyler Durden aside, these are our most macho symbols of all in the film, men who, within the construct of masculinity, failed. They are emasculated and, for the most part, are tormented by it. But, again, that pain only holds power if the loss is valued. Being less macho is devastating because these men see themselves as having nowhere else to go. And that is the constraint, the cage, of toxic masculinity. Then the movie goes... Mm, revolutionary. Now, this is complicated because it's not something that is, shall we say, practical as a real-world analog, but it's a brave idea. Operation Mayhem recognizes that without a total destruction of the status quo, the old forms will merely rebirth themselves in the new. Operation Mayhem itself is, as we've already discussed, a copycat of corporatism, built to destroy corporatism. The only solution, so it proposes, is a radical deconstruction, throwing everything away and starting from scratch. Now, the way that this is proposed is explicitly naturalistic in tone. The clock will roll back, society will collapse, and the world will return to an agrarian ideal, where men can be real men. However, that's not the way it can play out. Tyler Durden, the embodiment of machismo, is vital to orchestrating the destruction of the old world, but is also a thing that is unwelcome in the new. The movie ends with society collapsing, embodied in the crumbling of giant phallic buildings, then the motif is cemented by the insertion of three frames of a flaccid penis. The real enemy is Tyler Durden, the fake, invented, internalized masculine ideal. He abuses Jack, pressures him to conform, makes him self-destructive, and, in basically every single way, makes his problems worse than they were before. And in those final moments, after Tyler is dead, Jack is finally able to connect with Marla. It's not even romantic or sexual, per se. They don't kiss, they just reach out across that gap and hold hands while the old system crumbles around them. 
Only after Tyler is dead is Jack able to be around Marla without it being either sexual or confrontational. Only then is he able to be something that is outside the cage of being a real man. And here's the thing. Even though Jack was a pretender in the support groups, even though he was faking it, it was working. The ability to open up, to be sub-ideal, to be less than whole, and accept it, well... Babies don't sleep this well. In contrast, the freedom of Fight Club's toxic machismo is... I got right in everyone's hostile little face. Yes, these are bruises from fighting. Yes, I'm comfortable with that. I am enlightened. Again, this is not an indictment of being a father, of being strong, of being a protector, of being sexual. In fact, there are many, many positive messages in society that are strongly coded as masculine. Honor, respect, duty, loyalty, honesty, skill, self-improvement, curiosity, and every other Boy Scout value is something that our culture holds as predominantly masculine. I mean, hell, I just referred to them as Boy Scout values. And those are absolutely positive, strong values that everyone can and should aspire to. But there are also toxic values like violence, sexual aggression, anger, and combativeness, and a narrow, inflexible social script that tells men and boys that they must be providers or they are failures. They must be protectors or they are failures. They must be number one because number two is just the first loser. They must be horny or they're lesser men. They must like competition or they are weak. Case in point, in response to last episode, I was sent this. Right off the bat, it's an assault on my sexuality, gay baiting and an attempt at undermining my manliness. This isn't even unusual. The most common insults I've received over the last few months are beta, mangina, pussy, faggot, and white knight. I've been called girl as an insult all my life. This is toxic masculinity. This is men attacking other men by accusing them of being insufficiently macho. It's also misogynistic because it implies that the worst thing a man can be is a woman. So what's the answer? Well, it's better role models. It's calling out this toxic behavior when we see it. It's dispelling harmful myths like boys will be boys and holding men accountable for their violent behavior. It's accepting that feminine is not antithetical to masculine and vice versa. It's a world where being a man encompasses both of this Let's get down to business. and this <laughs> dark and silent and complete and more. 